Welcome to the weekly podcast number 219. Can you believe that we've sat down 218 times and spoken to you, dear listener, nor me? Anyway, after all those episodes, it's time for me to share my impression of Moira Stewart. For those of you that don't know Moira Stewart, she's a wonderful newsreader and she's now on Chris Evans' show every morning where they say morning worm catchers. So here we go. Yay! Oh, it's nice. Anyway, on this week's show, we've got a Monty cast. We have Farmer Phil talking to the Shadow Agricultural Minister, Jim Pace. And we have Ricardo, who has escaped from Wiggly HQ in the Wiggly van with the Wiggly tan. Yeah. And gone off to HFW's Hugh Fernie Whittenstall's abode for the spring do. If you were there... Give us a call. Let us know. What did he say? Did he sell you anything? Mushroom logs were apparently very popular. Anyway, first of all, here's our latest reviews. 22nd of March. Thank you very much to Shelley Meg. She gives us five stars and says, Wiggly Delight. I simply love this podcast. It blends serious information about farming and environmental issues with a hefty dose of fun and laughter. As a regular Wiggly Wiggly customer, I appreciate the fact that the podcast gives me such an honest insight into the workings of the business. The real life cast of the podcast are more entertaining than any characters created for fictional soaps. (laughs) Hmm. I could listen to Farmer Phil talk about more or less anything and remain interested for hours. If only I could say the same, Shelley Meg, when going out to the River Cafe with Farmer Phil, who is obsessed with talking about DEFRA. Anyway, Heather's infectious giggle is well documented, but she's also great at posing the questions that draw out the most interesting answers. Ricardo is like an eager puppy. Bouncing all over the interviewees. He always sounds so breathless with the excitement of what he is trying to say. And you will hear that again, Shelley Meg, in a moment when he gets overexcited at River Cottage. The interaction and relationship between all three is often hilarious. I downloaded the archive and it cheers me up enormously every time I listen. The Radio 4 style quiz was brilliant. I can absolutely picture Farmer Phil's face when the points for creating the Wiggly Wand were awarded. And the innuendo filled tea tasting episode is another of my firm favourites. Well worth keeping on your iPod for repeated listens. Thank you very much, Shelley Meg. And if you want to listen to that Radio 4 episode, it's number 200. One more review before we get on with all the nitty gritty of the show. It's great, says Ellie Nurse 82. Hi, all the Wiggly team. Just wanted to say how much I love your podcast, as Heather is always telling us to. Yes, I do. If anyone else would like to put a review up, we'd be grateful on iTunes or anywhere at all. I suffer from depression and I often can't sleep. So it's lovely to be able to listen to your tales from around the farm whilst I'm lying in the dark. Also, Heather's laugh brilliantly drowns out my husband's snoring. Keep up the great work. Thank you very much, Ellie Nurse. Now, I hope you'll be fine because what I'm about to tell you is we're having a short break. So don't get too depressed because we will be back with you on the 3rd of May, the day after Farmer Phil and I's wedding anniversary and Michael's birthday, but I expect he'll cut that out. The day after Farmer Phil and I's wedding anniversary and thank you, Ellie Nurse, very much for the review. Let's go on to a Monty cast, a weekly fact on wiggliness. Take it away, Monty. The Monty cast, a weekly fact on wiggliness. A quarter of hedgehogs do not survive their first year. Another Monty cast next week. 
Thank you, Mont. He's been working at the warehouse all week, picking. I've checked we're insured before those health and safety folks have mentioned you are just jumping up and down. I phoned the NFU. We've made sure all is in order. He's 13 now. It's fine. We've been using this child labour for many years on the Wiggly podcast. So what's the difference? If you get the wrong parcel, blame Monty all week. Now, Farmer Phil had a huge opportunity the other day. He was invited to go and listen to the ministers talking about the future of agriculture. And incidentally, yesterday, he had lunch with Prince Charles talking about the very same thing. I didn't get to go. Hmm. Anyway, here he is with Jim Pace. You'll have listened to Hilary Benn a few weeks ago. This is the Shadow Agricultural Minister Department. And so we'll see what the others are going to do for us if they get in. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I don't know. And if the Liberal Democrats are listening and they want to send us somebody for the podcast, come on round. We're not fussy. We haven't got any political views. (laughs) Only joking. And I'm here with Jim Pace, who is the Shadow Minister for Agriculture in the Conservative Party. We're at the Guild of Agricultural Journalists conference leading up to the general election in a few weeks' time. Jim, thank you very much for giving me the time to ask you a couple of questions. As a tenant farmer, over the last 10 years, we've seen the profitability of our mixed farming diminish. And it's got to the point now where, for most tenant farmers, it would be best described as marginal. How do you see us really dealing with the volatility of the markets that we're experiencing and are going to experience, given that our cost base has gradually increased over the last 10 years, which has obviously dented its profitability, and that if we're not careful, we're going to end up with all these farmers living off their diversifications and their various other bits and pieces. The core business of farming is going to become secondary or even non-existent in some cases. I, I certainly think you're, you're absolutely right about your description of the situation and we're certainly going to see have to learn to live with this greater volatility of prices. That's the nature of living much more in the, in the open market as, as the industry does now. I do believe that in the longer term with the world population growing and climate change and other reasons, I think that the outlook for farming is very good. And we're going to have, as indeed we've had over the last two or three years, some massive swings in prices. And, and the industry is going to have to learn to live with that, maybe be putting money away in the good years uh, to help them through the, through the lean years. Uh, and that is what farmers in some parts of the world have been doing for a very long while. There are mechanisms within the CAP by which the government could have some sort of income stabilisation mechanism. But I've not yet really found much enthusiasm for it amongst the farmers I've discussed it with. Um, And it would obviously be taking money out of other aspects of of, uh, the CAP uh, to fund it. So maybe it's not the way forward. Uh, But I do do have this fundamental gut instinct that the future is good. And uh, hang on in there. Do you feel that should you be part of the next administration that you'll be in a position to address the upcoming reform of the CAP in 2013. I'm thinking particularly in a reduction of the regulation and the costs associated with it, both for the countries concerned and for the individual farmers. Well, as far as regulation is concerned, I've no intention of waiting till 2013. I mean, you're right that the, the CAP reform, the next round, will, will, will have a regulatory element, but I've already said that within three months of being elected, we will set up a joint industry body uh, to review all the regulations affecting agriculture at the present time, get rid of those that we can, remove any unnecessary gold plating, which Britain has added that other countries don't, but most importantly of all, to shift the whole focus away from our obsession with process, much more to simply measuring outcomes and to saying to farmers, we're going to trust you uh, to do the right thing, Uh, We trust you to find the best way of uh, improving animal welfare, reducing pollution, or whatever the objective of the regulation may be. Uh, Yes, come down hard on those who don't do it, but actually setting farmers free to find their own solutions without the mass of form-filling tick boxes, uh, etc., etc., which is the real cost burden to the industry. As a cross-border farmer, that is indeed music to my ears. My final question, really, Jim, would be that 
given that I think within agriculture, because of the environmental responsibilities that farmers have and the sustainability of that relationship requires farms to have a mixed outlook and a mixed group of people running them. We've heard this morning about the proposed large dairy unit in Nocton and I'm of the opinion that some of these very large units are actually best placed to deliver environmental benefits because they can afford to. How do you propose to maintain, for want of a better phrase, the smaller family farm and its profitability without giving huge profitability to these very large industrialised type operations on a plate as it were. What I'm trying to say is that by being business-like, size obviously can get economies of scale, but we want to probably maintain the smaller farms. Well, it's a highly emotive issue and it always begs the question, what is a small farm? Indeed, what is a family farm? And the sort of size will change dramatically from different parts of the country, different sectors of the industry. And so it's very difficult to know how you actually design um, precisely what it is you're trying to do. But in a world where governments no longer set prices, quite rightly in my view, um, the profitability is going to be much more down to the individual farmer uh, as long as the government, and uh, I hope it's a Conservative government, has gone out of its way to make the market work fairly, to deal with issues to, with animal disease and biosecurity, to uh, deal with issues to do with food labelling and the uh, supermarket ombudsman and to create a much better environment for business to succeed and prosper and obviously deal with the regulatory issues which I've just uh, discussed. Uh, I think if government can create that environment, then good business, then whether they're small or large, uh, will succeed. No government can promise a future for every farm. If you look back at the history of the last 100 years, even within the CAP and the old guaranteed price system before that, farms have been getting bigger through all that time. I, think I, I frankly don't see that changing. I think what I was alluding to was I wasn't suggesting that government intervention in you're a farm I'm going to sustain and you're a farm I'm not going to sustain is the way forward. Mm. What I was really thinking of was that if the larger units tend to produce the more commodity based mm -hmm. produce and the smaller units are given the freedom to take advantage of their marketing abilities and their USPs which they undoubtedly have mm -hmm. because they mm -hmm. are probably individuals it's under those circumstances that farming can flourish in a balanced way but at the moment the smaller units are being buried in regulation and competition from places that they can't actually compete with and it, that, that was more the, the aim of my question than suggesting well, you well, sir, after a load of regulation. I, I think your, your, your fundamental point which is that the smaller businesses are, are going to have to look at specialist markets, niche markets using their own uh, specialist uh, abilities and, and selling points. I think that's absolutely right, uh, and leave the big boys to compete in the in the global commodity markets at a lower price. I mean, commodity price markets are generally lower than niche markets. Um, but yes, we've got to make sure that we can get rid of all the regular unnecessary regulation. Obviously, some regulations are necessary. Nobody's proposing to ban them all together, but make sure that firstly the only necessary ones are there, and that those that are are applied as uh, as helpfully as possible. One of the things said to me by a French farmer I know uh, some time ago was that anybody goes on to a French farm to inspect them, it's with a view to helping them to meet the requirements of the regulation, advising them where they're going wrong. The inspector goes on to a British farm, it's with the sole intent of taking money away from them if they can find the slightest breach. It's a cultural thing that has to change. Probably precisely reflected in the fairly straw poll approval rating that DEFRA got last year on the Farmers Weekly website of about 96% of people not in favour of them. So I look forward that if, if you're successful in May that we can perhaps turn that approval rating round a bit and get DEFRA working for the industry rather than against it. That's absolutely our objective. We want DEFRA to be seen as the friend of the industry, not as a controller regulator. Well, thank you very much for your time. I suspect that you've got a couple of months of hard labour in front of you, and I wish you all the best of luck, and we'll perhaps catch up with you after the general election. Thank, thank you, you very much. much.
Thank you, Farmer Phil. If you are ready gardening, really rocking, we've got a lovely Grow Your Own Wildflower Meadow at the moment. Mr Rob and Miss Allison have got lots of plants that are varied, so we've put together a pack. So if you want a wildflower meadow and don't want to spend too much money on it but want an easy answer, then we've got just the answer. And remember, your wildflower meadow isn't just going to look lovely. It's going to save you mowing that darn lawn. And it will be an army of pest destroyers that eat aphids while they go around supporting bees, which are pollinating your fruit and your veg. And on top of that, it will provide you with 14 guaranteed species of butterfly. Only joking. But we did have 14, honestly. Don't phone me if you don't get 14. Michael's just got his head in his hands. There we are. Ricardo went down to Hugh Fernley Whittingstalls. Here he is on a day at River Cottage. The ones on that side are a bit less bitter than the ones on this side. These have been let to grow a bit too long. Okay. Well, I'm here in, uh, in, a, in a fantastic polytunnel with Alex Heaton, nonetheless, who I've just come to talk to, I mean, not intentionally, uh, uh, but, you know, you, you seem particularly affable, so it seems pretty reasonable <laughs> for me to, <laughs> me to have a chat. Yeah, I mean, you're, this isn't your, uh, your role, though, is it, really, in the, in the garden? No, I think I've done just about every other role at River Cottage there is to do. I have done production in the TV side of things, and I know I work in events currently, but I've done just about everything. I have my hand in all the pots. OK. Fabulous. <laughs> so, so as far as the events are concerned, the, the River Cottage, what's the kind of main focus down here in the valley? Well, we really like running our day courses. We, we run, range in everything from gardening courses to butchery. We have fish skills. And we also offer our evening events, which are kind of more dining in the evening times, like Fridays and Saturdays and things like that. But loads of popularity. We also have bread courses, which are exceedingly popular okay. as well. So just anything you really like to cook. Fantastic, That's and people the people are quite happy to uh, to come along. And, you, you yeah, know, really, you guys... really big interest. You know, kind of we offer them anything and they take it. So yeah, <laughs> <That sounds laughs> lots good, of courses it? in development. Yeah, because successful we just keep... branding, I think. <laughs> exactly, <yeah. laughs> we just keep finding things that people want to learn about. Definitely. Which which are the most popular courses? The bread ones are really great because I mean anyone has got a kitchen and a countertop and flour available to them so they can make bread. But our butchery courses are really popular as well for both people who have pigs or who just kind of from a consumer point of view want to learn more about the cuts that they're eating okay so along with the ethos of river cottage it really kind of flows well into the butchery side of things fabulous and who runs these courses um, i mean a mix of people associated mix of with... people yeah exactly yeah, we kind of have our various specialists so um butchery and <coughs> meat me. type things are done by ray who is our kind of on-site meat guru yeah, Ray's, Ray's, um, he's a very good speaker as well exactly right, yes yeah, he's yeah. quite <coughs> a personality he is. we've got john wright who does some of our foraging stuff who also writes all the books all the handbooks and yeah. things that are to do with foraging yeah. we've got Pam, who does our jam and our preserves courses. Yep. Our bread course is taught by Dan Stevens, who wrote the bread book, but it's also taught by Gid um, Hitchin, who developed the build and bake course. Right. And gardening is all taught by Mark and things like that. Indeed, so we've indeed. We've got absolutely. kind of our own little list of specialists. That's quite nice, isn't it? Yeah, really? it's, it's great. It's a various, uh, it's a kind of smorgasbord of, yes, exactly. uh, of knowledge, really. Yeah. Yeah. And in the mix is always our kind of kitchen team, Gil. So Gil always kind of comes in and lends a kind of cooking eye over everything and kind of tells you what to do with what you've been learning. Yeah, well, yeah. interestingly, I, my, uh, my, my friend who I brought down today, uh, Tanya, who also works at the company that I used to work for yeah. a lot, and Wiggly Wiggly, so our, um, yeah, she wanted to come to meet Gil today. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. But it was her husband that actually <laughs> asked whether or not she could come down because uh, she was a little bit shy. And, uh, right, so of course. She, she isn't actually no. shy. <laughs> As it turned out. Uh, yeah, things transpired. But yes. I did come down a few years ago. I met Gil. We built the wormery. Oh, know, great. That, uh, that Excellent. Yeah. So he, yeah he's a, Gil's a great he's, character. He's a gentleman. Yeah, yes, he is. Indeed. indeed. So, you know, as far as these events are concerned, I mean, are they always completely booked up? I mean, this no. today, for instance, the autumn and the spring shows, or rather yes. the spring and the autumn shows. Yeah. We have such a large amount of tickets available, so they do do tend to sell out. But um, we always get cancellations and things like that. So there always kind of are. There's there's always tickets available to the most things. Our courses do get sold out quite quickly. We tend to release dates about four months in advance, and usually about the month and a half before they're sold out or close to it. But it's always worth calling because there's some last minute deals and cancellations, and we always try and fit people in where we can. So okay, fantastic. Yeah, oh, food for thought. Exactly. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, you're very welcome. 
No, you didn't pay those. No, 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 I didn't know. Well, I'm stood here with Steve Lamb, who I met several years ago, in fact, when I treated my lovely wife, Sarah, to a, a hue and friends evening, uh, when you guys were a completely different base then, yeah. uh, over the border, in fact. Yep. At the end of a day, Steve, spring event, lots of planning, things like that. I mean, you know, are you are quite tired now? Are you ready to go home? I am quite tired, but it's not like doing a shift down the mine. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, no, I suppose it's, it's quite... It's, it's I suppose quite, it's not. That's not really the... <laughs> I expected that. So, so, yeah. I says, isn't there? You spent much time down the mines. <laughs> no. Well, up north, that's all we do. We all have to work down the mines or go down the pit. No. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lovely setting, but there's, most of the work is done a couple of days in advance. However, sleep and rest is not really on my agenda just right. now. Right. With having a four week old baby. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, congratulations. Thank you, baby yeah, Agnes. Fabulous. So, um, so that's your first uh, initiation first. into fatherhood. Then. That's right. Yeah, yeah. it's just like lambing. Yeah. <laughs> well, it wasn't. No, it yeah. wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> Grab hold of a pair of legs, <laughs> tug it, it away, or the arms yeah. even. No, yeah, no. swing it out to clear its lungs. <laughs> I go down well in the maternity ward, wouldn't I? Yeah. Oh, fair play. So, what's your what's your role here, generally, Steve? You, you seem to be a kind of man of, of all uses, really. Thank you. That's very kind. Of. Can I have that in writing, please? <laughs> yeah, I'm perfectly prepared to put yeah. something down in paper. Uh, we're not very we're not very big on job titles, but I live here on site. And my main responsibilities are how the site works. I've, I teach on courses, but okay. it's generally making sure that people who are here at River Cottage generally get a good experience so it's things like the aesthetic the quality of the experience yeah i'm sort of in charge of livestock not necessarily feeding on a daily basis but you know what animals to have how they equate to what we do here right pretty much anything that the customer or the guest see has the ultimate responsibility with me even the re- oh, wow. the rebed and the toilets <laughs> <laughs> so much varied. Yeah, you, you don't often see that on a business card. No, you don't. No. <laughs> Responsible for the uh, read bed, the processes, all the all the uh, sites for excrement. Yeah. No, yeah. no, not at all. Oddly. No. <laughs> but, so, but I mean, you know, your 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 sort of expertise. I mean, what's what's your favourite course? Do you suppose? Well, everything done here is on a seasonal basis, yeah. and like many things, you tend to look forward to the next season. I particularly like the foraging courses right. with John Wright. We have quite a, a great time going out with John. You know, he's one of those people that has an enormous amount of knowledge and turns the countryside into what is obviously 3D, but you, you learn layers below that. Right. You know, Indeed. what's poisonous and what's good to eat. Yeah, uh, yeah. And creates quite a... That's, that's a great course because it gets people out and about. I'm sure it is, actually. I mean, that's probably something that I'd really like to do because uh, my uh, my knowledge of all things fungi is pretty limited. And, uh, you know, it yeah. seems as though there's a whole lot of feasting opportunities out there that yeah. are easily picked without with little effort. That's right. In as fact, as you know what you do. Yeah, and there's that slight element of jeopardy as well, particularly with the mushrooms, because there are probably about... 6,000 different types of fungi in the UK alone and, and John knows all of them and all the Latin names God. and only 10% of those are probably edible and the question is because we're mostly uh, known for our philosophy on food and how to go about getting good and free food uh, if you like on a forage then the question is can everything can you eat it can you eat it and very few times you can yeah, on a mushroom yeah. forage but a good percentage of those are poisonous so we tend to say well learn the top five most edible ones and the top five most poisonous ones and those two polar opposites will never will never cross no no you don't have to be John Wright and learn all 6,000 that's just showing <laughs> off isn't it <laughs> it is showing off yeah. indeed fantastic well, it's a pleasure speaking to you and you too it's Thanks, lovely to Steve. see you take Cheers. care pal thank you Ricardo if you are in Hereford Hospital then you can listen to us, the Wiggly Podcast, on your hospital radio. And if you are in another hospital and have this podcast on and would like them to also share the podcast, tell them to email me, heather at wigglywigglers.co.uk. We'd love to share our podcast in lots of hospitals. I'm sure we can make the world better. (laughs) Anyway, there we go. If you'd like to follow us, we're on Twitter. I'm at Wiggled. Farmer Phil is at Farmer Phil without an 
E. And Ricardo can't go on Twitter because it only has 140 characters. And obviously that would be taken up with... Uh, um, well... <laughs> That's the way it is. I hope you've had a lovely Easter. We will be back after a short break. For those of you who want to know what we're up to, well, you'll just have to come to the website, www.wigglywigglers.co.uk, or you'll have to go to where we are, Facebook or Twitter. We're actually popping off for a small trip back on the 3rd of May. Don't miss it. Bye from me. Welcome to the Wiggly Podcast 210. Can you believe 210 times... Is that right? 219, I think. Oh, I wrote it down. Oh, yes, here it is. <laughs> what a twerp! I hope you'll be fine, because what I'm about to tell you is we're having a short break. Keep cheerful, because we will be back with you on the 6th of May... Third of May. Oh, <laughs> don't get too depressed because we will be back with you on the third of May.